When trying to determine just how well a video game has aged, there's a good amount of factors to consider. Now, a timeless story is a timeless story, however, some aspects, like the gameplay and pacing for example, can definitely show some more age than others. Of course, there's still a bit of subjectivity involved, but still, I don't think many people would be out there arguing that longer loading times are better than shorter loading times. Anyway, last year we released a video about JRPGs that have aged well, and it ended up being one of our most watched videos ever. Naturally, a part 2 is overdue. If you haven't seen part 1 yet, I strongly recommend you do so. We cover some of the more obvious examples there. My one rule for the list is it has to be from the PS2 GameCube generation or earlier. Everything after that is still just too recent in my opinion. <laughs> Come on, man, that's too new. I'm talking about that old school, man. You know what I'm talking about. All that aside, let's just dive into the meat of the video. Here's an unranked list of 8 great JRPGs that have aged well. Part 2. Alright, to start off this list, we have Final Fantasy Tactics. This PS1 Squaresoft classic really needs no introductions. While it's definitely not the first tactical RPG ever, it did popularize the genre in the West to a certain degree. The game's creator, Yasumi Matsuno, had previously directed titles such as Ogre Battle and Tactics Ogre and borrowed a lot of elements from the latter when making this one. It's just a bit more streamlined and accessible this time around. By the way, the Ogre series is awesome too, you should check it out if you haven't yet. We actually included Ogre Battle 64 in our part 1. Anyway, Final Fantasy Tactics was Matsuno's first foray into the Evil East universe, which would later include other games like Final Fantasy XII for example. And man, did he create a classic right out the gate. To this day even, I would even go as far as to say that it's one of the most beloved entries in the entire Final Fantasy series. It truly is a timeless game. Let's talk about why. First of all, the gameplay offers a ton of depth and customization. Being able to experiment around with different classes and team compositions in each playthrough gives the game a lot of replayability. Even if you cared about just gameplay, there's still plenty of strategy to be enjoyed all these years later. It's not just deep gameplay that has made this title age so well though. The story also holds up extremely well. It deals with more mature themes such as xenophobia, classism, war, corruption, religious dogma, and stuff like that. It's a very gripping narrative with excellent writing. Some of the best dialogue in the series for sure. Oh yeah, on that note, it's also important to mention that there was a PSP remake called War of the Lions that features some new content and a new translation. The writing in this version is a lot more Shakespearean and proper-like. It kind of comes down to personal preference, though many would consider this the definitive version due to the additional content. Thankfully, regardless of which version you decide to play, you're going to be treated to outstanding music. I think it's got one of the best OSTs in the entire series, hands down. There are some extremely chill and relaxing tracks that get stuck in your head for days. The same thing goes for the game in general, it's just really addictive. It was great back then, and it's still great now. So, if you haven't played this timeless classic yet, what are you waiting for? The next game we have on our list is Skies of Arcadia Legends. There's an original Dreamcast version, however the GameCube version has additional content and a reduced encounter rate, so yeah, it's the one you want to play. The Dreamcast version did come with an exclusive minigame called Penta's Quest though, but you can check out our latest video about the history of minigames and JRPGs if you want to learn more about that. Anyway, Skies of Arcadia was developed by Overworks, a developmental division of Sega. I think it's aged well for a variety of reasons, though the biggest being the atmosphere and the exploration. The game came out over 20 years ago now, yet there's still never been an atmosphere quite like the one in Skies of Arcadia. I mean, what other RPG can you be a swashbuckling air pirate and fly around on your ship discovering new lands? Well, maybe nostalgia for the DS, I guess, but Skies of Arcadia is better. It just has such a strong sense of wonder, discovery, and adventure that few RPGs can match. The only others instantly coming to mind being Grandia, Lunar, Nino Kuni, and another RPG that you'll see later in this video. Visually, I think the game holds up pretty well too. Environments are colorful and character models have a lot of charm. The characters in general are just really likable. Vice is an awesome protagonist and one of the best in the genre in my opinion. Combine all this with an engaging story and fun gameplay and you have a timeless JRPG. 
I like how your characters actually move around the battlefield during combat. It's a small touch, but it just adds a little bit more immersion and liveliness instead of just them standing there in a straight line taking turns, you know? Oh yeah, there's also ship combat in addition to regular battles. This is just another form of a turn-based system, but it's still pretty cool. People like to complain about the encounter rate, but I don't know, I didn't really find it much worse than most other RPGs from that generation. Plus, once you unlock Ika's Lambda Burst skill pretty early in the game, you can clear most random encounters in like the first turn, so it's really not that bad. All in all, Skies of Arcadia is an excellent title and one of the better games in the genre you're gonna discover. Get it? Discover? Because in this game you make like, discoveries and shit and... Yeah, Alright, yeah, let's just move on. Alright, you know what, this was dumb. Dump it. Coming up next, we have Terranigma. Terranigma is the third entry in Quintet's beloved Heaven and Earth trilogy that came out for the Super Nintendo. However, I would say Terranigma is definitely the most famous out of these three with its reputation. Not just for its quality, but for its obscurity as well. You see, while Soul Blazer and Illusion of Gaia came out in the States, Terranigma did not. It did come out in the PAL region though, which probably marks one of the rare examples of the PAL region actually got a great RPG that the States did not. Of course, this sucked for me at the time, but hey, I can't even get mad. You guys already had to miss out on so many classics that the least they could do was throw you a bone here and there. With that said, this kind of gave the game like this mysterious, legendary status over here in America as we always heard so many amazing things about it on the forums, yet it remained untouchable to us. People considered it right up there with games like Chrono Trigger, Final Fantasy VI, and Super Mario RPG as the best RPGs on the console, so needless to say, its reputation preceded itself and there was a lot of hype around it. Did it live up to it? Well, I mean, it's in this video, so yeah, obviously. Being a late Super Nintendo title, the presentation is incredible and the music is arguably even more so. Legit one of the best OSTs on the system. The tight controls and general movement is also one of the best from that era in an action RPG. However, perhaps the most memorable aspect about the game is the story. I wouldn't say it's like a really complex one, but it is very deep and thought-provoking. It's centered around recreating and resurrecting the world, however, I don't want to go into it too much. The less you know going into it, the better. Earlier I said how oh, this was the third entry in a trilogy, so you might be thinking that you need to play the other two first in order to play this one. That's not the case though. They're more disconnected thematically and not directly. All in all, Terranigma is an outstanding RPG that's aged super well over the years. Due to it never officially coming out in America, it's kind of like one of those games that only the most hardcore of RPG fans even know about these days. Thank god I'm porting and emulation exists though. I promise you, it's worth checking out. The next game we have on our list is Wild Arms. This early PS1 RPG developed by Media Vision more resembles a Super Nintendo RPG, however, that's not a bad thing. Some 3D games from back in that era can look a little rough these days, but 2D games on the other hand though, have generally aged much better in comparison. Wild Arms is a great example of that. Well, at least the overworld exploration. Battles are in 3D and these are... Nah. Yeah, not very good. Most other aspects about the game have aged extremely well though. The blend of the Wild West, medieval fantasy, and sci-fi is so unique and cool, and the music is absolutely incredible. Probably a top 5 OST on the system for me. Yeah, I know that's saying a lot. The characters and villains are also some of my favorites on the PS1. The main three are likable, the supporting cast is great, and the villains get a lot of screen time and are very memorable. I always love fleshed out villain groups in JRPGs, and Wild Arms especially shines here. Boomerang in particular is just so awesome and one of the goats. The aspect that Wild Arms is perhaps aged the best in though is the exploration. It seriously kills most of its peers in this regard. The tool system gives a lot of variety to overworld and dungeon exploration and kind of gives it like 2D Zelda vibes. It's also similar to Lufia 2 which I know some people have been asking us to cover, so to that I say, stay tuned for our next video. Anyway, a lot of dungeon design from back in that era is pretty basic to be honest, so Wild Arms really sticks out here. I didn't really give the game enough credit until recently, but between its unique atmosphere, the charming graphics, the memorable characters, the amazing music, the captivating story, and the fun exploration, I think that Wild Arms is one of the better aged RPGs on the PS1. If you want to hear some more of my thoughts about the game, we did release a complete hour and a half retrospective over it last month, so check that one out if interested. It's definitely our longest, our most in depth, and perhaps our best retrospective yet, and also one of my personal favorites we've made for the channel. We also showed its sequel, Wild Arms 2, a lot of love in our video about underappreciated RPGs. That's a good video to check out too.
Coming up next, we have Dragon Quest VIII, Journey of the Cursed King. As we all know, Dragon Quest is the granddaddy of JRPGs, however, for the longest time, this series never really took off in the West. That is, until Level 5 and Square Enix dropped this classic for the PS2. Dragon Quest VIII proved to be very popular worldwide and is still a massive fan favorite to this day. What was a game changer, you ask? Well, I think it was definitely the presentation. The previous seven Dragon Quest entries all look pretty similar. I mean, of course, there were graphical leaps between generations, but when the seventh entry still draws a lot of similarities to the first entry, maybe it's time to switch it up. Visually, seven felt very dated when it came out for the PS1, so when eight came out for the PS2 with some of the best graphics on the console, it was like, holy shit. It's the first time for the series that Toriyama's iconic art style was finally brought to life so well. Eight's protagonist design is my favorite in the series, and seeing it being animated so well was just awesome. Even stuff as simple as actually picking a book from the shelf to read it felt like a huge leap forward. As far as actual visuals, the cel shaded style has helped the game age extremely well. It's the same reason why some other games from that generation like Wind Waker, Okami, Wild Arms 3, Dark Cloud 2, and Rogue Galaxy still look so good today. The former two also being level 5 titles. With how colorful the environments are too, it just creates like this really comfy atmosphere. Traversing the realistically scaled overworld is just so awe-inspiring and nails this sense of adventure. The world map theme really helps sell this feeling. The story is your standard Dragon Quest fare, but the characters have a lot of charm and personality. Yangus in particular is like a top-tier Dragon Quest party member. As a kid, I kinda just thought he was whatever, but now as an adult, I'm like... Dude, we need more Yangus. The, the, this guy's awesome. He's like the ultimate ride-or-die homie. The story of how me and the gov fell in together is an epic tale, full of laughter, frills, and tears. It is, is it? Well, why don't you just give me the highlights? Whatever. You can tell me all about it later. Right now, I need some fresh air. I should have known a bird wouldn't get a story like ours, gov. When it comes to gameplay, I personally like Dragon Quest VIII's traditional battle system and the level of customization that it offers when building your characters. And if battle animations are too slow for you, you can always play the 3DS version where you can speed them up. There's also no random encounters in this version and additional content like extra playable characters. Graphical quality is obviously a bit of a downgrade though. Regardless of which version you decide to play, they both have aged very well and are well worth playing today. The next game we have on our list is Paper Mario. I guess we did include Super Mario RPG in our first part, so is this one kind of a cop-out? I don't know, I don't think so. Super Mario RPG was a Squaresoft game, whereas Paper Mario was developed by Intelligent Systems. They maybe didn't have quite the reputation the Squaresoft had, however they were responsible for the Fire Emblem series, so they clearly knew a thing or two about RPGs. They put their skills to work and made an incredibly enjoyable and timeless game. I gotta be honest, I'm still a Super Mario RPG fanboy at heart, but Paper Mario is probably my second favorite Mario RPG. Yes, it's even above the Thousand Year Door for me. Don't get me wrong, I still really love that game and everything they expanded upon with it. However, with more content, also came some more padding and backtracking. The backtracking in particular can be super annoying in some chapters, so I just prefer the tighter pacing of the original. You really can't go wrong with either though, they both have aged very well overall. In my opinion, the biggest factor of this being the fun, lighthearted, humorous, and charming atmosphere. It's just so goofy and cheery that it's like impossible to have a bad time when playing it. The whimsical music, the wacky characters, and the witty dialogue only adds to this. The whole paper aesthetic may have been seen as an odd design choice at the time, however now it helps give the game a timeless look. It's one of the best looking games on the N64. The gameplay, while pretty simple, is also a lot of fun. Having some light platforming in between battles helps keep things engaging, and the battles themselves also do a good job of engaging the player with the whole timed hits mechanic. The different playstyles between party members add some much needed variety to keep things fresh as well. Simply put, Paper Mario is just a fun game. It accomplishes what it intends to, doesn't wear out its welcome, and provides a very satisfying experience. Like most other Mario games, it stands the test of time damn well. Coming up next, we have Fantasy Star 4. Fantasy Star was Sega's sci-fi answer to Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest and the fourth entry in the series is why they consider it to be the best. In fact, when talking about the best 16-bit RPGs of all time, Fantasy Star 4 often gets thrown into that conversation. It really is that good and has aged fantastically. Let me explain why. First of all, the comic book panel style cutscenes add a lot of personality and flavor to the game. This really helps give it a unique identity compared to other RPGs from that era. It just does such a great job at immersing you in by letting you see the characters in the world in a whole new light. 
Speaking of characters, big fan of them too. It's a very memorable cast filled with a bunch of diverse races and species and they play off each other well. I always love it when games give you non-human party members. It's part of the reason why the cast in Chrono Trigger, Final Fantasy IX, and the Breath of Fire series are so memorable to me. Another thing Fantasy Star 4 does really well is atmosphere. Yeah, pretty common trend with a lot of games on this list, right? Create a timeless atmosphere and people will be more likely to want to go back and just exist in it again. Given the sci-fi setting, there are different planets you can travel to in Fantasy Star 4 and this is awesome. It helps the universe feel alive and lived in and provides nice new scenery. You got highly advanced technological facilities, deserty, Tatooine-like vibes, snowy places, and yeah, they're just cool environments to explore. While I wouldn't say the music is quite as good as some of the best soundtracks from that generation, it's still pretty solid overall and always fits the atmosphere well. Gameplay-wise, probably the biggest reason why Fantasy Star 4 has aged so well is the macro system. This allows you to be able to set preset commands for every character in a turn that you can perform with the click of a button. So, if you know you have a specific strategy that you like to start every battle with, you don't need to set every character's action individually. You can just set a macro for it. This is pretty convenient and saves time. More RPGs should do this. However, my biggest critique with the battle system is the naming of spells and skills. These are in their own language pretty much and are really unintuitive. You're not going to know what any of them do unless you just look them up online or do good old trial and error. At least in something like the Final Fantasy series, it's pretty obvious to tell that a spell like Lazaga is probably going to be a blizzard-like ice spell, but in Fantasy Star 4, Watt is an ice spell. What? If anything, I would think Watt would be thunder because, you know, Watts and electricity and stuff and yeah, I don't know, Yeah, it's just not good. This is just a small nitpick though, Fantasy Star 4 is still a classic that has aged extremely well. We did release a retrospective over the game last year, so if you want to hear some more of my thoughts about it, check that video out. Alright, so I'm adding this part in after the fact as I forgot to mention it earlier. The easiest way to play it nowadays is definitely the Genesis Collection. This can be found on pretty much every system ever. Alright, and to finish off this list, we have East, the Oath and Felgana. This beloved Falcom franchise is the longest running action RPG series that's still going on to this day. It's given us a lot of amazing titles over the years and The Oath and Felgana is often considered one of the best. It's actually a remake of East 3, Wonders from East, which came out for a lot of systems, however it wasn't very good, so yeah, hence the remake. At least the Super Nintendo version wasn't and that's probably the version most people played. Most others weren't released in English, so I can't really comment on them. The SNES version is just way too grindy though and you get wrecked by like the first enemies in the game. Oath and Fulgana on the other hand, while it may be quite challenging, it's a fair challenge, man it's fun. It's the middle child of two other East games that came out around the same time using the same engine, Ark of Nepishtim and Origins. Ark of Nepishtim has great atmosphere, but being the earliest is the least polished for sure, whereas Origins is the most polished, however it takes place in the same tower with no towns and stuff so I'm not really crazy about that. To be fair though, the environments do vary quite a bit, however I just like my worlds to feel, you know, bigger. The Oath and Philganum strikes the right balance in between these two for me. Gameplay is very polished and you still get to travel around a lot, visiting diverse locations. It's definitely my personal favorite out of these three. While story always takes a backseat to gameplay in the East series, and don't get me wrong it still does here too, I still found the plot here quite engaging and enjoyable. A big part of this is due to the great voice acting performances by some of the key characters. Chester in particular had a lot of range and emotion and was always very compelling to listen to. And eliminating the parasitic slime who sits on Valestine's throne will benefit the entirety of Felgana as well. Now then, why don't you hand over the statues so this can all fall into place? To those that have played Tales of Zephonia, you'll probably also recognize Elena's voice being the same as Colette's. She's got a very recognizable voice I feel. Besides a few examples though, the voice acting overall can be pretty mixed. There is a lot of it too, though you can always turn off the voices if you want. When the game originally came out in 2005 in Japan, there was no voice acting actually. However, when I got a port to the PSP 5 years later, that's when they included it. And that version did actually make it to America. With that said, that version is expensive as shit, so you're probably just better off playing it on Steam. It's pretty cheap there. Overall, The Oath and Felgana is just an excellent, tightly paced title. It's some of the most fun I've ever had playing an action RPG. The vigorous, energetic music just amp you up to explore environments and take on gigantic bosses, which are also a huge highlight in this game. Seriously, the music along with the boss battles might be where Felgana shines the most. They're both so damn good here. So, if you haven't played this one yet, I highly recommend it. It only takes about 15 hours to beat and has aged quite well.
Alright, and that about wraps up this video. Thanks for watching everyone, we hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please either consider hitting that like button or subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. What are some other RPGs that you guys think have aged well that we didn't list here? Let us know in the comments below. Like I mentioned earlier in the video, some of the more popular examples we already listed in part 1, so just keep that in mind. I can already see tons of comments listing Chrono Trigger, but yeah, trust me, that was in part 1. Oh yeah, and if you guys want to see a part 3 to this topic sometime, let us know in the comments about that too. As always, just want to give a massive thank you to our Patreon supporters, and an extra special shout out to our top patrons, Derek Drost, Jesse Spencer, Jump Rock, and Sayano. You guys are the best. All of your support and generosity is very much appreciated. Other than that, thanks again for watching everyone, and hope you have an awesome day. This is Corbin from Gaming Productions. Until next time. Open your eyes. Open your eyes. You are the light. Our light. Now go.